Hello everyone, thank you for the introduction. So the title of my talk, as they said, is Unpaired Sentiment to Sentiment Translation Using Reinforcement Learning. So we will see what exactly is Unpaired Sentiment to Sentiment Translation is. So the aim of this topic, or the aim of this project, as we say, is whenever we do a sentiment to sentiment translation, that is whenever we try to change the sentiment of a sentence, maybe from positive to negative or negative to positive, either ways, the context, context of the sentence is not generally preserved. So we lose that. For example, if I say, um, my hair is looking really good, and if I want to change that, my positive sentiment to a negative one, and I would say something like, the experience was horrible. Here, the translation is successful, but the content of the whole uh, topic that we spoke of is lost. So this is why we need to use a reinforcement learning method, which is a new method coming out in public in the, not new, but like now we are using it in natural language processing, in computer vision, apart from robotics as well. So we will see how exactly that works. And that we will be using, because it is about sentiments, so we would be using two different modules, emotional and neutral. So there'll be an emotionalization module, which will take care of changing the style, and that will be a neutralization module, which will help us preserve the context of the sentence. Yeah, so this is like what I explained. So whenever we have like a sentence which is sentiment-based or which has an emotion, we call it a style. Style is emotion and sentiment both, can be a combination, can be multiple in one sentences. So the underlying sentence or the context of that sentence should not be changed whenever we perform a style transfer. So that's one thing. And that is what sentiment, sentiment translation is all about. Like I said, the food is delicious. This is the source input. And what we get as what the model generates here is what a bad movie it was, which is the output. Generally, when we are doing normal sentiment analysis, we just try to identify which sentiment we are talking about from the whole corpora or from the whole uh, context. We don't try and change it. We don't try and manipulate or work with different kinds of styles and see how we can use that in our semantic information or how we can actually extract more semantic information from that. That is where sentiment to sentiment plays a huge role. The topic here has been changed from, from uh, positive to negative, but the context has completely eradicated, right? Now the reason why this happens is, we will just see each one of them, there are three major reasons. One is that the semantic information actually gets separated from when we separate the emotion and the neutral module. And the semantic uh, information gets lost. So we will get the emotion module and we will get the neutralization module, but we won't be able to combine together to talk about the same context that we spoke initially as our source input. That's one major reason that we lose our semantic information when dealing with sentiments, while applying a style transfer. That, because that happens because we use the same dense network and we separate them into two different parts. So we don't have both the parts together. The second thing is all information gets mixed up and it's not um, mi mixed up in a way that we have both the information combined together. It's mixed up in an uncomprehensible way. So it's very difficult to find um, let's say, weighted embeddings to create or to generate sentences which will have the semantic information from the previous one. And the third is that we do not have any supervised parallel data. Now, what does this supervised parallel data mean? Uh, whenever we are performing style transfer, to evaluate or to identify if we've made the right um, sort of transfer, style transfer, and the preserved meaning is, you know, um, retained, then that is possible only if we have a parallel, parallel data which has the same sentences with different styles. For example, if I say that this coffee is extremely delicious or this food is extremely delicious, and then I have a parallel corpus with a different style, 
which talks about uh, the food was not very good, but the service was okay. Now here, there is a parallel corpus which talks about the same thing, but the styles are changed. And that helps us evaluate or validate how our model helps. But finding something like that as a data or as a corpora is not, very, it's not possible. So we apply reinforcement learning to generate a parallel corpus and then we see, okay, can we apply sentiment to sentiment translation now that we have a parallel corpus? That's the whole idea of this project or of this task. Now, how do we come up with the solution of finding the parallel data, which is a supervised parallel data, which I just explained? We use a cycle reinforcement learning approach that, con that consists of two major paths, which I just briefly explained. Uh, one is the neutralization module, and the other one is the emotionalization module. And we will see how each module works. So the first one is the neutralization module. If you see, it says here, it's responsible of extracting the emotions from the complete sentence or the complete input source. So let's say I have um, a sentence as, um, uh, the food tastes delicious. So delicious here is the emotion or the emotionalization weighted word. That would be extracted out and the entire neutral sentence would be the food is very. So it's very important to identify these uh, nitty gritties of the, or those words which are basically contributing to the factor of sentiments or styles. And that's the whole point of neutralization module. It filters out. Whereas the emotionalization module, now what it does is, now we have a sentence from the neutralization module that this food is very. We need to add a contrasting uh, style that was added before, like which was delicious as the source input, but now we would put something which is, uh, doesn't taste good or is very unpleasing or something like that. That would be added by the emotionalization module. Here, if you notice, we are also taking care of the semantic content of the sentence that has, been in, that has been used as the input sentence before. Because our sentence has not been changed, only the style has been manipulated. So this is how uh, the cyclic method of reinforcement learning works, and now we will see how exactly these modules perform. So exactly, they remove the sentimental information, you get a neutralized sentence, and that neutralized sentence goes to the emotionalization module. You construct the original sentence by adding sentiment to it, which is the opposite sentiment. And let's see if you can uh, understand this. The gradient is no longer differentiable over the neutralization module. This line specifically means that while learning, while understanding how much is my dropout, whether this particular style would be extremely contrasting towards the first uh, in, uh, style that we took as the input source, how would we able to understand that this much would be accepted as a style transfer? So this is the method that we use. We use a policy gradient method from reinforcement learning. If uh, anybody here would uh, know that policy gradient is like a very common approach for uh, reinforcement learning. And this gradient, basically, when it's no longer differentiable, that's when it decides, okay, now is when you have to add the respective emotion. And based out of reward mechanism, because that's how reinforcement learning works, they select the one which has the maximum. Uh, reward. Like I said, the policy gradient is used. Uh, they use a reward mechanism, which helps you generate like the feedback, and that feedback basically helps you define the right emotion that you need to add so that the sentiment-to-sentiment -sentiment translation can work, preserving the context of the sentence, because that is something that uh, none of the models are able to do it till now. Now, adding the different sentiment also, preserving the context, it also depends on the quality of the generated uh, text that you've used and the reward. That is also what I just explained. Now, the quality, which I was mentioning, how we will evaluate, like, okay, this sentence, let's say, um, delicious, should have, like, an equilibrium-based word that can be generated. How can we find that targeted sentiment? 
One way, one way is to identify is that it matches the sentiment. We scale them down and it matches the sentiment in the contrasting side with the same scale. And the other one is to see, of course, if the content performance, uh, the content preservation performance is uh, retained. The last thing is that the neutralization module should identify the non-emotional words and the emotionalization module should enhance uh, or uh, probably generate better emotional words or better uh, style words so that uh, these kind of style transfers can be easily maintained. Okay, that's, yeah. So the contributions that were made is that, of course, there was this cycle reinforcement learning approach that was used with an unpaired data. So it had only one uh, set of data which had only one single sentiment. With that, we generated a set of different uh, corpora with the opposite style using reinforcement learning. And then those semi-supervised uh, learned data, was, they were used to see if the style transformation was possible and the translation was preserving the original context also of the sentences that were used. And uh, for this, generally, whenever we are doing a sentiment analysis or emotional analysis, we, or opinion mining, for example, all of them, they use lab, uh, reviews and they have their respective sentiment labels. For example, let's say you are at a restaurant and you are ordering food or uh, you are at a restaurant and just eating food, for example. So there's always like sentiment analysis that has been done based on your feedback. And those feedback generally just explain how much you as a user were able to enjoy or were able to conduct with a set of, let's say, styles that you liked about it or you disliked about it. But there is no manipulation that can be done that, oh, maybe if we arrange our uh, mechanism or we change our setup like this, the person would itself learn how to change the style. And that would help like a lot of industries in the sentiment analysis uh, business, which is generally one of the most um, overpowering industry these days. Also, this approach tackles the bottleneck, which I also explained initially. There have been previous uh, approaches that have used this, but unfortunately they have not been able to preserve the context, and they have just tried to generate some random sentences which fail to keep the meaning of the whole context. And because of that, there hasn't been much work which can really take sentiment analysis as a topic really forward. Now, how does the experimental result show that the context uh, was preserved? Let's dive into that. Now, this is how um, the whole structure looks like. So first, like I said, that this is um, the neutralization module. Now, of course, we need to understand that for the model to understand that this is the style, we have to use a self-attention-based pre-trained mechanism, which has basically learned to identify the styles. This helps you, uh, the, you, the model to identify the styles which are present in the sentence as the input. So once the sentence goes into the neutralization module as an input, after getting pre-trained um, pre from the self-attention, self it basically uses LSTM and sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, which identifies using weight uh, weighted uh, vectors and weighted mechanism that which word would have the maximum uh, weighted result and that result will from the self-attention we will realize that that word is an emotion word. So let's say they had different weights 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 and this one is 0.7. So delicious because of the self-attention that we've pre-trained before, would understand, okay, delicious is something that has the maximum weight, and while uh, going into the emotionalization module and going into an LSTM and sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, it will discard this here from the classifier, this would be discarded, and only the neutral words, the food is very, would um, go into the emotionalization module, which you can see here, and there is an asterisk on top because there is, it's like a placeholder, you can imagine, which basically would help you identify the uh, position and the word where the style transfer should take place. After this, once it has gone into the emotionalization module, there are basically two LSTM pipelines that you can see. 
One is the positive one and one is the negative one. So the emotionalization module will basically generate both the emotions, the positive and the negative, because here we have a placeholder, sorry about that. Yeah, so we, they will generate both the sentences and then there would be like a comparison done, how much overlapping uh, is done with the input sentence that was given as the food is very delicious. Now, of course, there is like a direct overlap that you see between uh, the positive sentences generated here in the emotionalization module and in the, the one in the neutralization module. So if there is like a direct overlap, the sentence is going to be discarded and the, con and the other sentence would be picked up, so which is the negative one. That's why here, if you see, the delicious here overlaps to this delicious completely, and the, that's why this positive sentiment is um, discarded, and the module selects the one which is, uh, or the, the other one, which is the negative one. And the sentence here is, the food is terrible and tasteless. And this is exactly what I explained, that it's just extracting non-emotional words. And that's, that, that is being done using the self-attention method. Now, to see how exactly the rewards are found, this is um, a derived F1 score in the terms of uh, confidence, sentiment confidence, and the blur score. I will just put both of them so that more, or maybe let me just explain this first. So if you see here, the sentiment confidence basically evaluates if you've achieved the targeted um, sentiment or not. You can maybe just read. If the generated sentence has matched the targeted sentiment that was expected. So first you generate a confidence score, and the other one is the blur score. The blur score basically helps you measure the content preservation. It is also used, very commonly used in translation, a machine translation, for example, language translation, style translation, preservation of content, etc. Uh, and this um, work was done on two major food review data set. One was the Yelp, and the other one was the Amazon food review. In the Yelp one, there were around 4,000, um, sorry, 400,000 uh, data set uh, data points, where 10,000 10K were like for training, 3K for validation, and the rest was for testing. Similarly for Amazon, it was 230K for training, 10K for validation, and the rest for 3K for testing. There have been, like I said, previous work about uh, how does um, this model has outperformed and has become state of the art. So there is a work which is called cross-alignment autoencoder, which was proposed. And this method is using the latent representation to perform the style transfer. And there was another one, which is the MDAL, which is the multi-decoder adversarial learning. So here, this method is using adversarial learning. Adversarial, is learn adversarial learning, uh, maybe if you're aware of, let's say, um, GANs or um, denoise, diffusion probabilistic models, those models are based out of adversarial learning approaches. And the first one that I said are cross-alignment autoencoders. So they try and cross-align each word to see they perform different kinds of alignments, which are very commonly seen in translation of one language to another, to see if uh, they can preserve the content of um, the input sentence and see how well it is translated. Now let's see how does the evaluation model perform. The G-score here is the geometric mean between um, the confidence, ACC is the sentiment, the confidence, and blue score is the um, content preservation uh, evaluation technique. So if you see, the cross-alignment uh, method on top produces a very small content preservation result, 1.17, whereas the proposed model that I'm just talking about uh, really outperforms and it comes out to be 22.46 on the Yelp data. And also with MDAL, it's very similar. It has... Um, it's also about 1.64, but uh, overall, it's both the models have not been 
very good at preserving the context of the sentence. And that is what translation is all about. To also preserve the context, even if we are dealing with manipulation of the style. Again, with Amazon, you see there is like, again, a very big jump. Here, the sentiment um, targeted to achieve the targeted sentiment, I would say this model was comparable or not that great, but it was still, there was uh, like the major difference was by, I would say, in the Yelp data, not in the uh, Amazon one, because it's still comparable to the MDAL result that it got. But in G-score uh, G that you see here, the geometric mean, for both the models, it really outperformed and it was able to preserve the context really well. There was also a human evaluation done to see how well is it performing, even if the models are not performing. I mean, the results from the models are not that great in the previous two models. They also wanted to check if it's possible to see the human evaluation and still if you can see that it's still uh, performed much better by the two baselines that were proposed before. Now, since it's a very research-based question, sometimes people think, how can we use this in the industry? So one application is that we can use style transfer in neural machine translation. So nowadays, um, when we do like translations, we use NMT approach, which is neural network-based uh, translation approach, where you use uh, the technique of sequence-to-sequence autoencoder-decoder, and you basically uh, try and use uh, human engagement to increase your, I would say, efficiency to translate. The second thing is uh, text generation. So text generation includes emotion preferences of users, and that basically helps in the translation method to control the styles and to manipulate, or to maybe even like generate better forms of styles. So I would like to conclude here, uh, just one second, yeah. That um, this task basically was able to generate an un from unpaired data, semi-paired, semi-supervised parallel corpora, and then it was able to also outperform the state-of-the-art models that we used as the baseline, and now this has become the state-of-the-art in terms of semantic um, preservation, and also it uses um, a cycle reinforcement learning method, which is like one of the most, uh, I would say, the future would be one of the most usable approaches to get human-like results. Uh, there's still a lot of things can be improved in this also. I mean, every work can be improved, so exactly like that. Here we see that the sentiment or the style that has been transferred does not really uh, intensify or does not really quantify how well the translation or how well the, I would say, the emotion or the style can be measured. So we can also provide a mechanism to check if the intensity of the style is also preserved of the same, in the same context. So yeah, thank you very much. And if you want to reach out to me, um, you can reach out on, to my Twitter page or to my LinkedIn, and that's my YouTube channel. So thank you. Thank so you, is Sachi. there any questions? Yes. Any questions? I guess you can also find Sakshi later on. Oh, please. Uh, a question about uh, some languages uh, support uh, double negations. Do you, uh, did you try something with that? For example, if you have uh, sentence mm -hmm. is double negation as input, what are you going to receive at, as an output? So you mean like multiple emotions in one sentence? Yeah, but uh, at the same time you have a sentence with double negation. Not one negation, but double. Yeah, a same sentence having multiple emotions. And negations. Neg multiple negation. Yes, okay, negations. so, uh, like, yeah, thank you for the question. So, um, like I explained here, maybe I can go back to that slide and it'll be more helpful. So, uh, the self attention based method to, for, which was used for sentiment classifier here, 
that maybe you can see. So this um, classifier itself had learned how to include multiple uh, negation, and also because if there will be two negation, it would be a positive sentence, right? So that was already uh, with this self-attention-based classifier method, it was already learned by the model, and so it was uh, most likely uh, that it would be in, maybe let's say, it's not really helpful to go to this place, or or maybe like I'm not able to find the right sentence, or let's say there are like two negations which is just making the sentence look positive. So that, all that edge cases were already uh, considered in the self-attention based method mechanism. And that's why uh, with the reward based system, initially maybe it will not perform well because that's how reinforcement learning approach works like. But the policy that you use in the policy gradient algorithm, initially it will not perform well, but gradually with uh, multiple learning steps, it will start understanding if how two multiple or maybe not two, just multiple negations are there or multiple emotions also are there. Then um, the classifier here, let's say there'll be like two different emotions or two different sentiments. Then both the sentiments would have like two different placeholders and the sentence would be generated accordingly. So yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Um, hi. Um, um, on the rewarding step, mm -hmm. how so you do the step where you naturalize the sentence, but then in the other module we will add uh, negative uh, words or tokens, right? Mm -hmm. And so where when does the model stop, or when do you decide that the f the modification was a good modification? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for the question. So um, if you see here, like there is an asterisk, maybe I can just point from the screen and it will be more visible. If you see here, yeah. So here, uh, both the sentences are generated, not just the negative one. Both the sentences are generated, whether it's positive or negative as the input, we don't care about that. We generate both the sentences and then we see how much overlap is done. So whenever there would be like an asterisk, which would be the position signifying to the model, okay, this is where we have to add the emotional, emotionalization um, words or tokens. So based out of wherever there would be an asterisk or wherever there will be like an empty token, let's put it like that, they will be adding those respective targeted styles and that's when the model will understand, okay, that's where I have to generate both of them. And then we see how much of an overlap it is with the input source or the input sentence. So let's say here it says like a direct overlap. Probably there might not be a direct overlap. And here, let's say the generated sentences, the food is very tasty, for example, or the food is very good or is of very good quality. So then there might not be a direct overlap, but there might be some content preservation that is there. And we would then see if the style is again positive or not. If the style is positive and the style here was also positive, then also that sentence would be discarded and the other one, the contradicting one, would be accepted. So it, it basically sees where the empty tokens are and generates sentences based out of those places, I mean those positions. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We have time to take more questions. Hi. Hello. So, if there's any semantic content in the tokens you remove, mm -hmm. uh, is that lost? So, for example, if the uh, here we have delicious, right? Mm -hmm. um, if that was actually like colorful, for example, right? Or, you know, yeah, something like colorful. Uh, uh -huh. would the model produce the same output? Because it seems like from the diagram that uh, it doesn't know that token was delicious, right, once it's removed. So it wouldn't be able to reconstruct like uh, a bad version of colorful in this example. Uh -huh. I think I partly understood the question, but um, I think what you mean is like if it is not delicious but colorful, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what is given as the input, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah. So is it the case that... Mm -hmm. The word the, is maybe not clear, is what you mean to say. Uh, well, really what my question is, is is the emotionalization module yeah. uh, predicting, so for the missing tokens for which it's predicting, right, mm -hmm. is it just 
doing that based on the context. So for example, here, is it just seeing the food is very and it has no other information about that final token? Okay, so, okay. So what the emotionalization module is doing is that it's, um, it actually uh, has to first find out or identify whether there is a style present or not. So f to do that, we use a pre-trained self-attention method. Let's say there is a neutral sentence, um, I'm going for a walk or something like that. Then to generate um, the styles, it won't be possible, right? Because there is no style in the, pre in, in the f input itself. So to come to your point, if it's like the food is very colorful, that itself would be, maybe there might be both the sentences generated, but there can be a situation where um, the content preservation works fine, but the style generation does not work that great. Because um, for colorful, it, would, it can be like maybe the food is very dull or something like that. So there would be a generation of the opposite style or the contradicting style, but the content preservation probably would not work that well. That's possible. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Okay, then okay. let's give Sakshi a big round of applause. Thank you.